welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. I want to introduce a friend of mine, if I may. His name is Pastor Byron Graham. His wife is Ann Graham, and they are a blessing. They're from Queensland, Australia. They have a wonderful church there called the Highway Church, and um, Pastor Graham has just been a great, solid, healthy, strong pastor leading that area. Got Deborah's been there a couple of times preaching the gospel. He never invites me, but Deborah's been there a couple of times, and and you know he is. Uh, uh, they've treated her really, really good, and they've become dear friends over the years. And we're excited about Byron and Ann being with us this whole weekend and how great it's been uh, just to be friends and hang out together, talk about Jesus and do all the other things. So Byron, before we go any further at all, just wanna, just wanna welcome you and tell you to get up here and bring your Bible and tell us about Jesus. Will you do that? Come on, let's give the, will you stand and give the Lord a great big praise for Byron Graham. Well, you may take your seats. It's great to be here with you tonight. I um, have such an affiliation with this church uh, when you talk about miracles like you've been singing about tonight because you've been a part of uh, amazing miracles in my life. Uh, but first I want to uh, ask Annie. Annie, why don't you come up and say good day if you've got a mic there. This is my bride of 34 years. Why don't you say good day, hon? Good day. It means hello. It does mean hello. It means hi. Great to be here. We have been so looking forward to coming. I've been to the Rock Church three times now, and I tell you, you are in my heart. We will go home. We we visualize you guys. We brag about you guys in Australia. We talk about your pastors a lot. These guys mean the world to us. They have influenced and impacted our lives in ways that we can't describe. You have an amazing church and we came in here this morning and isn't it wonderful? It doesn't matter where you live, the presence of God is exactly the same. Come on. And so we just so, like you, we are just in love with Jesus and lovers of the presence of God and we live on the eastern side of Australia and uh, we're just, we, we believe God has got us poised and ready for a mighty move of God across our nation. And we sense the same anticipation and expectation here. So we're going home to pray for you. And we're just praying, God, open up the windows of heaven and pour out your spirit upon our nations. Come on. And just bring a fresh understanding and awareness of the Holy Spirit. Love you. We're going to have a great time with God tonight. See you soon. Thanks. Well, let me just start off by uh, talking a little bit of a testimony about you guys. And uh, I was here in 07, I think, uh, when I preached uh, here uh, in September. And uh, that next year, um, I was in India uh, on one of our mission trips, and I discovered a lump in my throat. And so when I got back to Australia, they they told me that it was uh, stage four throat cancer. And uh, that was a little bit of a shock because I'd never, I didn't know what that meant. I said, how many stages do you get? And they said, well, you don't get any after this. You're at the the last stage. And so we went on a journey and uh, your pastors um, had all the intercessors in this church uh, praying for me. And one of the most humbling things, and we're singing about miracles tonight, uh, is, is that the body of Christ all over the world, people were praying for me. And it was such a a humbling experience to know that people in Holland that I'd never ever heard of or knew were sending me emails saying, we're we're praying for you, we're praying for you. And uh, of course, you know, this church and many other churches up the east coast of uh, Australia where we live. And and, uh, so we went on a journey then um, of uh, chemotherapy and radiation and um, over a nine month period. And there was one point, it was, it was December um, the 26th, is that Boxing Day? Yeah, Boxing Day evening. I thought it was my last. 
I thought that uh, it was over for me. And uh, I'm not one of those uh, super spiritual kind of guys that, that, you know, see a demon under every rock. But in the ICU ward, I was dying with septicemia. And, uh, and they couldn't control my blood. They couldn't control, they were frightened I'd have a cardiac arrest and die. And, and I looked out the ICU doors and I could see the face of a demon. And the demon was telling me that he's coming to get me. And uh, it's finished for you. It's over for you. And, and I laid there in that bed and I, I just, I was so sick I could barely care, to be honest with you. But you know what? After a little while I realized why aren't you coming? You know, you're making all these threats and all these... Why aren't you going to do it? And there was a, it was like a place around my bed that he couldn't come any closer. And I knew the saints were praying. I don't know too much about what happened, you know, because you're drugged up and you're all that, but I knew it. I could feel the prayers of the saints. I never heard the voice of the Lord. I never heard, you know, God speak to me, but I could feel the prayers of the saints. And I knew at that point I wasn't going to die. Isn't that cool? And uh, so we went on a journey uh, of about uh, six or seven months after that. And, um, you know, our church grew 100 people uh, while I wasn't there. I don't know what that means. Uh, I don't know whether to get excited or disappointed about that. But, but you know, the church grew and, and uh, Annie is uh, also a senior pastor of our church. And she carried the load and, and many other things. And it was just September last year. I was on the golf course, which is my passion, uh, one of. And uh, I was on the golf course and I, I felt a bit of indigestion. And uh, that wouldn't go away. And this indigestion got worse and worse. And it took me about the 17th hole because I was having a really good round. And I didn't want to leave. Um, but I was having a heart attack and uh, I ruptured an artery, a main artery on the left side of my heart. And so it took about two hours before I got into surgery and they, they tell me now that, you know, uh, people don't last that long. But we have a sustaining God, don't we? And uh, a powerful God. You want to talk about miracles? You know, I had a heart attack and they put a stint in my heart and then uh, five days later... I actually died. My heart stopped in, in the hospital. And, uh, you know, it was uh, for a few minutes. Um, and then they brought me back with the, you know, you've seen on, on the movies, you know, clear, you know, ching And, uh, you know, I was back. And uh, many people have asked me, did I see anything? And sadly, I didn't. I could have come back and wrote a book <laughs> and made a bit of money. But, you know... Um, and, of course, no one can disagree with you, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a pretty good subject. You're not going to get challenged on because who really knows? So, anyway, I didn't do that, but I came back to life, and they were worried, you know, when you, when you die for any period of time, there's no oxygen to your brain, and, uh, and they worry about, you know, brain damage. And Annie put him at rest because she said, no, it's okay, he's always been like that. <laughs> that isn't abnormal, he's, that's him. And, uh, and so again, your pastors and this church uh, went straight into prayer for me and uh, interceded for me. I was on your list, pastor said, this is it, no more, you're taking up too much of our time. <laughs> you know, you're a problem child. And... Uh, uh, but, you know, here I am today, uh, a miracle, and I give God the glory for that. I praise his name for that. But you know what it's done for me? It's done for me is that I've got this passion now that I want to build something. I want to build something. I, I want to leave something behind that will last for generations. I want to have something that will glorify his name more than anything else. I want to have something, a legacy that's left that will build the kingdom of God like nothing else. It's a passion within me right now. It's a drive within me. And I want you to catch a hold of this tonight because that's why we're here. 
That's why we're here. So uh, if salvation was the reason we were here, then we didn't need Easter Sunday. Amen? Because forgiveness for sin was on the cross. The blood of Jesus shed for us, forgave us of all sin. If that was it, if salvation was the end of the story, then we reached it then. But he rose again. He rose again so that we would have the opportunity to have uh, uh, the, the power of the resurrection Christ within us to build something, to build something that's going to last. And I know this church. Is, I watch you on the, on the web, you know, almost every second week I watch you and I, I see the way you're growing and I see what God needs to do. And I've got to tell you, you've got to get this in your heart. You've got to start to build something. Build something of worth. Build something that will sustain. Build something that will last for generations. You know, I think about um, in, in Scripture, the blind man, when Jesus came up to the blind man, and he, he asked him, what do you want? And I mean, to you and I, we'd be thinking, that's pretty obvious, right? The guy's blind. Why would Jesus ask him that question, you know, what do you want me to do for you? And I looked at that and it always puzzled me and then I realised, well, maybe that's not what he wanted. Maybe he had an ingrown toenail that was just killing him. <laughs> and he wanted that fixed. He was probably okay blind. He didn't have to get a job. He didn't have to, you know, drive down the street or ride his donkey or anything. You know, he might have been very happy being blind. But Jesus wanted him to get specific on what he wanted. And that was the challenge to me. I had to ask the question, what do I want? What do I want out of this life? What do I want out of this Christianity? What do I want out of being, you know, a member of a church? And it just wells up within me. I want to build something of worth. I want to see the lives of men, women, and children transformed right across. Everywhere I go, I leave a legacy that lives can be changed and transformed. Can, can we have that video of, of India? Is, is that up, up on the screen? Just watch the screen for a moment. Hi, I'm Joel, and this is The Housing Project. So, so far, we are in the middle of completing the 54 of the original houses that we started uh, two years ago. Now, they are in the process of getting rendered and painted, uh, electrical, all those things finished off. And we've also, while we've been here, we've poured 14 roofs on these new houses here. And so these are going to be the, in total, we'll be doing 19 new houses here, which will be brand new homes for these families to come and live in. So, so far we've raised about $50,000 towards this project. The whole project is going to cost around about $75,000, so at the moment we're trying to chip in and find the extra funds, so we're still looking for that to finish this project 100%. But what that money so far is going to let us do is get all of these houses uh, to the point where everyone can live in them. At the moment, the families that were living in grass huts in this area have uh, shifted their huts to the other side of this street here, and they are, um, they're waiting on completion so they can move back into these finished homes. So not only have we been looking at this building project while we've been here, uh, we've taken the opportunity to look at all the other uh, little programs that Highway has been involved with in Nasapur. So uh, we have provided presents uh, for the, and sporting equipment for the children in the orphanage. Thank you. Thank you. We've been and visited the widows' homes and checked up on them. We've seen the rice fields that Highway owns and inspected the grounds there. Uh, we've looked at the fish farm 
and, and looked at uh, and what's required there. We've also been well, there while they were catching fish for the children. We've also played two cricket matches with the children and the, and the kids from the orphanage. At the moment, Australia and India is one apiece. So we invite any good Australian cricketers to come on the next trip. It's really important, not only that we do this work in the communities, that we also beat India at cricket. So we really want to thank you for being a part of this project. Without your support, we couldn't have done all this and we couldn't have made such a change and an impact on these people's lives. So we really appreciate everything that you've done, whether you've purchased a brick or a window or a complete house. Uh, everything has come together to make this happen. So we look forward to, to working on more projects and, uh, and, and getting more things done in this community in the future. You know, people have asked me, why do you bother like going to India? Why do you bother, you know, going over? The, the problem is so huge. And as we look around us all over the world, we know that, that it's just a huge problem everywhere. It's not just India. It's all over this world. But you know what? If we, if we pull together as a body of Christ, as we pull together as a church, whatever we lay our hand to, you know, we can build something. We can build something. Ultimately, that'll be 80 homes that will be finished. And, and uh, uh, you know, thankfully, that next day after we showed that video in our church, that, that next service in the morning, you know, the money came in uh, like that to finish off the whole project. And uh, we're able to build a suburb, you know, in India. We're just a church. We're just a small church on the east coast of Australia. But you know what? When we all get together, we can do something amazing. When we all get together, we can build something of worth that will last for generations. These people are the rat catchers. They are the poor of the poor. That's their job. They go into the rice fields and they catch the rats. The good news is they get to keep the rat. That's the good news. They get five rupees a rat, which is about 10 cents American. And, uh, and if you ever go to India and if you ever see straight tail pheasant on the menu... It's not a bird. It's not a bird. But you know, we can make a difference. We can join together. And I'm not asking you to be a part of our mission field. I'm asking you to be a part of your mission field. I'm not here to try and get you on board with this vision tonight. I'm here to try and get you on board with your vision. And I'll tell you why. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. When people ask me, why do we bother? What's the point? I put them straight to this scripture. It says in verse 3, Praise be to God, our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in every heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and his will. i got to tell you, God has a plan, and you're a part of it. God has a plan that has been in place before creation, and you are part of it. He knew you would be here tonight. He knew that, that you would be created with gifts and abilities that no one else has but when they all come together as the body of Christ, I've got four points here today I want to challenge you with because the reality is, you know, to be, to be a Christian is great opportunity, amen? It's great opportunity to be a part of a family like this, a house like this, a heritage like this, a destiny, a vision like this church has. It's a great honour, but with that honour comes responsibility, and we can't be passengers in the body of Christ. We've got to be on board with the vision that God has laid upon us, that he has predestined before time for you and I to be a part of in our parts of the world. And we can't shirk that. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, will I be a part of what God's doing? And let's build something. Let's build something. The first thing I notice in that passage of Scripture in verse 4 is that he chose us. 
God chose us. If we were building a man thing, then you know, you can take it or leave it. But I've got to tell you tonight, when God chose us, when he has predestined us, when he chose us before we were in our mother's womb, and he knew us, and he equipped us, and gave us gifts and abilities, he did that for a reason. And I love it when it says that, that, that he chose us, but it's not some sort of an elitist thing. It says that he chose us in him, in him, in Christ. It's not the work of man, but the work of God. And I know what you're thinking because I thought the same thing. I thought, God, have you really got the right address? You know, do you really know who you're talking to? I shave every morning. I look in the mirror. I live with me. It says, someone who's a better choice, then I think you should find them. But no, he said, no, you. You're the one. Each one of us the ones that he has chosen. You know, you may not even know Jesus Christ in your heart tonight, but I tell you this, you are chosen of God. You just don't know it yet. You just haven't chosen yet. You think you don't, God doesn't know you. He knows you. He knows you. He purposed you. He has, he has fashioned you in a way. Why is it that you sing better than that person beside you? Why is it that he's gifted you in certain ways that other people don't have that gifting? It's because he has equipped you for a purpose and for a destiny that only you can fulfill. You've just got to take a hold of that now. You've just got to begin to walk with that. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says, Just that each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to the other. We were chosen by God, to be a part of a body that was moving in purpose and direction and destiny to build something that will last. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. I don't want to miss out on that. You know, I was a kid that they used to line up. I don't know whether you did it in America, but, you know, that when we used to play football or something, they'd line all the kids up and two captains would pick that one and then pick that one and pick that one and then pick that one. Well, they finally got to me at the end. I was kind of default. You know, I was the one that was left, so I had to go somewhere. You know, I didn't want to live my life like that. If I'm chosen, I want to grab a hold of that. I want to grab a hold of what God has chosen me to do and live it to the full. And we are chosen to be a part of the body of Christ. We are chosen to function. And I've got to tell you, there's, there's, there's no sadder sight than to see somebody who has parts of his body that no longer function, that just are disabled, that just hang there, that just, they're just there. If I had an arm that was just, just there, but it didn't do anything, you know, I'd be disabled, wouldn't I? I mean, what's the point? What's the purpose? And sometimes we come to church and, and we feel just like that arm. We feel like, you know, I have a purpose, I have a destiny, but I'm not doing anything. And I'm just hanging there. And there's so much that could be a part of my life because he's chosen me to build something of worth. And number two tonight, it says that he's chosen me to be, in verse four, he chose us to be, to function according to his purpose, to be as effective as possible. And see, the function of our life is to represent who we are, who we are. In the body of Christ, you know, if... If we were all parts, and, and if you can imagine tonight if I was a leg in the body of Christ, then my job wouldn't be to open the car door. I mean, I don't think physically I could do that anyway at my age. You know, my job wouldn't be as a leg, you know, to scratch my head. But if you want to go somewhere, if you want to go and feed the hungry, if you want to go and I'm your leg... I'm the one that's going to take you there. I'm the one. That's my function. That's my purpose. That's what I've chosen to be. That's what God has gifted me to be. And you know, there are so many purposes and so many abilities and gifts that just sit in the body of Christ. 
And God is saying, come on, we've got to go somewhere. We've got to build something. We've got to make a difference. Will you function in that place? That the body is whole, the body is strong and not disabled. To be. And for reasons only known to God, you and I are chosen to be holy and blameless in his sight. Not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. But we're chosen to be holy, to have a, a reverence for God, a, a reverence and respect towards God. We're chosen to be blameless, to live a life in such a way that we don't misrepresent who we serve. It's very important in this generation, very important in the cultures that we live in. You see, I call myself a Christian. The word Christian means Christ-like. Now, my responsibility is to represent Christ the best I can. If I call myself a Christian and, and you know, I break into homes and, and steal from people and rob people, and th- I wouldn't be a great representation, would I, of, the, of Christ who I represent. Everything in my life people look at and, and you know, they evaluate who we are. And it's important that as the body of Christ that we represent Christ in the best light, that we do the best justice to his cause. This morning I noticed we had the sheriffs on the platform here. It's pretty cool because we don't have sheriffs in Australia. We have coppers. Uh, But these sheriffs are really good because I remember seeing those in the the westerns when I was a kid. And uh, it was good to see a sheriff. But if you look at a sheriff or a law enforcement officer, there's an expectation, isn't there, upon their life? You look at them, there's an expectation that they should be above, you know, breaking the law. They should be above certain standards. Why? Because that's the authority that they represent. And the world looks at the church like that. They look at us in that same representation and have that expectation. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So our aim is not to be perfect, because that's never going to happen. But to be a representation of Christ that is accurate, so that his message is not in error. That the message which is our life, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'm a prophet and uh, well, I don't have much prophecy. But do you know your life prophesies a message? Yeah, it does. Do you know everything you do prophesies something about you? It it's unspoken, but it's accurate. It's accurate. You know, people can talk about how they do this and how they do that. And you can watch their life and it just doesn't line up. We cannot misrepresent the Christ who died for us. There's a Christ code to be, to be, because I've been chosen by God for a greater purpose, to build something of worth, to build it together as a body of Christ. Number three tonight is because he predestined us in verse five. And when you think about the whole concept of creation, it begins with an idea a need or a desire. You see, God, for whatever reason, desired to create the earth and to create mankind, a desire to commune with his creation and all of those things. And it's like if you use the example of an inventor. If if somebody has a need, then then somebody sits down and, and, you know, they invent something that is going to meet that need. Is that right? I told you before, I had heart attacks last year and and I died. And because they didn't understand why my heart just stopped, they put in a a pacemaker and a defibrillator in my chest. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing technology. It is just, it's just 
you sit in a room and a technician with a computer screen, you know, can make your heart race. It can make it slow down. It can, he can stop your heart, you know, just by touching your computer screen. It's just they rub a, a mouse over your chest and uh, it picks up all the data of every heartbeat that you've had in six months or in how long you've had it. And, and it's just phenomenal. And, and, and he, can, he can move it up and, and you feel your body just you know, rise and he can pull it down and collapse. And, and you're sitting there thinking, this guy's got my life in his hands. He's got my heart, a function of my heart, on his computer screen at the touch of a key. I just hope he hasn't got a weird sense of humour. I had visions of him taking me to parties, you know, sort of, he was like, oh, 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 touching the computer screen. They have that much control over you. But you know what? Someone had to sit down and say, you know, we've got a problem with the heart, you know, and, and we need to invent something, a machine that's going to regulate the heartbeat. And I got two wires that go down and they screw into the wall of the heart. And then if my heart ever stops now, it's like bang. It's like the kick of a small horse, they tell me. And, uh, and it'll fire up and, and boot me alive again, you know. And it's like, who invented this? Who, who thought of this? It's just so brilliant. And God had the same idea. Because, see, when he created man, he knew that there was going to be a problem with the heart. He knew that there was going to be something in the heart of man that was just going to fail. It was not going to have what it needed to have. And so he created, he invented this this whole process whereby the heart of man can be transformed and renewed by the Son Son of God, the blood of Jesus Christ that washed over his life. God even foresaw, you know, that man's heart was going to let him down. And he created this process whereby the heart can, can, can be brought alive again the way that he designed it. I've got this amazing destiny in my heart. I've got this amazing future in my heart because God has created it that way. God has created me that way. And I've got to tell you, you will never be satisfied on this planet until what he has created has been put right, has been put right. You know what? I was an alcoholic. I was, I was 25 years of age. I was a hopeless alcoholic. I just got married to a beautiful young lady and, uh, and I did everything possible to destroy that relationship, everything possible. I'd start drinking at 6 in the morning. There was something wrong with this heart long before I had the heart attack. And, you know, I, I, I had no answer for it. I, the, the, for me, my only way out was just to get divorced. But, you know, Jesus stepped into my life. Jesus stepped into my life and said, wait a minute, I can fix that hole. I can fix that, that fault in your heart. And he did that. And that's been, you know, 30-odd years ago. And I can't tell you the transformation that Jesus has Not only physically has there been miracles in my life, but I've got to tell you relationally, he has transformed my world. I have generations now, generations that sit in church, generations that serve God. I've got my my grandchildren stand on the door and, and they hand out brochures to people as they come in. They serve in the house of God at the age of seven and eight. We've been adopted. We've been predestined. Verse 5 also tells us that we have this amazing adoption into the family of God. And this is the part I love. This is the part I love. This positions me into the household of God. That I am born again into the family of God. I am born again. I don't know whether that means anything to you, but, but if you came from where I came from, That means a lot to me. It means a lot to me. If you came from an alcoholic home that was totally dysfunctional, then to have a a family that loves you, to have a, a purpose, to have a direction in life is incredibly important. 
And the spirit of the world has tried to mirror this because originally the people of God lived this way. They had God as the head of the family. They were God's people. They were God's chosen. But in some process, in someone's bright idea, they decided, no, we we don't want God anymore. We want a man to lead us. And I've got to tell you, it was a disaster. It didn't work. It, It was a big mistake. And God sent his son to be sacrificed and then gave mankind a second chance to be in this royal family. I've got to tell you, I don't take that lightly. I don't take that lightly to be in that because the world will give you no chance, I'm telling you. God will give you every chance, but the world will give you no chance. Can you imagine me walking up, you know, to the guy at at Buckingham Palace with the big furry hat and saying, you know, I've chosen to be a part of the royal family. I don't think I'd get past the front door. If I wrote Queen Elizabeth a letter, you know, because we're still in the Commonwealth, you know, if I wrote her a letter and said, you know what? Uh, I've chosen to be in in your family now. I want to be one of your sons with all of your privileges. I won't hold my breath trying to get a reply. It's not going to happen, folks. But God is telling us here that he has open arms to position you in a place in the body of Christ, in a royal priesthood, a holy family. You know, you belong somewhere. You're valued and you're important in this house. Because the head is Christ and he loves you. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The truth is, the good news is, we get to choose that. It's our choice to say, yes, I want to be a part of the kingdom. I want to be a part of God's family. I want to be a part of that royal priesthood. I want to be a part of that amazing destiny, that amazing group of people, that body of Christ that is working together. You know those homes we built? I never paid for that. It was the body working together, sewing together, sacrificing together to build 80 homes for people they've never met. But they have a desire to make a difference. And I've got to tell you, folks, it's not about me. It's about them. Amen? It's not about me, brother and sister. It's about them. It never finished for me at salvation. I thank God for the forgiveness of sins upon my life. I thank God for that. I thank God that he's invited me into the kingdom, into his wonderful family. I thank God for that, but that's not the goal. That's just the open door. That's just the beginning of the greater purpose and plan that God has for your life. The question is, will you be a part of it? The challenge is, who will we live for? As a pastor, one of the things that breaks my heart is that people come to know Jesus and they accept this amazing life. This amazing transformation. I've got to tell you, if you're here tonight and you don't know God, you've got, to, you've got to know God. There's nothing like it. There is nothing to compare. It is, it is transforming. You will never regret it. I can guarantee that. But I find a lot of people get, get their lives right with God and they start to, you know, sort of come to church and that's it. It just, it just finishes there. Like they're good people. They come to church. They even tithe. They, but, you know, it's, it's greater than that. It's a greater destiny upon us than that. It's, it's, it's the generations that we're building for. It's the foundation, you know, that the Pastor Luke spoke about this morning, the foundation that's laid that the next generation will build on and then the next generation will build on that and build on that. 
Amen? Until you take this whole valley for Christ. What do you call it? The Inland Empire. That's not a slogan. That's a destiny. That's a vision. That's a function of this body to honour and glorify his name. And I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about this. And as a pastor, it's it's a challenge. And we look at it as our primary allegiance. You've got to discover what your primary allegiance is. You know in New Guinea, you know in New Guinea they have amazing churches and but you know they can leave church and if they have a family dispute they can attack each other with machetes and then next Sunday be back in church worshipping Jesus. Now you and I are thinking how does that work? How does that happen? Well It's whatever their primary allegiance is. If their primary allegiance is family, then Jesus has just added on to that. But when we get born again and we make Jesus our primary allegiance, no matter what happens in your life, you will always revert back to the primary allegiance, which is Christ. I've got to tell you, in my deathbed, and I've been there a few times now, I always reverted back to my primary allegiance. Did I understand what was happening? No. Did I think it was fair? I don't know. All I know is I love Jesus. And if it's my time to go, then then I'll go. But if it's my time to stay, then I'll continue to glorify his name. Why? Because he's my primary allegiance. I don't have another. And when I get born again and when I come into the body of Christ and Jesus becomes my primary allegiance, it doesn't matter what circumstance or situation or storm or trial comes against me because I'll always revert back to the rock, my primary allegiance. And I've got to tell you, it saved me. Salvation was at one point in my life, but I've been continually being saved all through my journey. Save me at every point from disaster. Can I ask you tonight, who is your primary allegiance? Who is it? I mean, when all else is stripped away, when life has gone so upside down for you, you don't know which way is up. Who is the primary allegiance that you revert to? And I've got to tell you, if you can say Jesus Christ, then you will always have the victory. You will always have the victory. And I want to encourage you tonight because there's a great opportunity ahead of you. There's a great opportunity to be a part of what the body of Christ is doing in this place. It's a great opportunity to connect and to walk together as the body of Christ whole with a destiny, with a future that will go for generations. But you've got to want it. You've got to want it. And if you want it, you'll choose it. And if you choose it, your life will never be the same again. I want to encourage you. He's a God of miracles. Why don't you be a part of this one? This miracle. Amen? God bless you. Thank you for your time tonight. Pastor. A lot of people don't know that uh, he drinks a lot of water and and the little Starbucks thing is because when he had radiation, he lost all of his ability to to, uh, have saliva. So here's a guy that's not going to let anything stop him from doing just exactly what he said. He could come along and say, well, you know, cancer of the throat. I'm no longer going to preach. I have no saliva anymore. I can't taste anything anymore. I'm just going to sit back and do nothing. I've done my job and it's over with. He chooses to get up here with Starbucks coffee. You you didn't leave it for me, man. Uh, I was going to finish the bottle for you. (laughs) Okay, you need it more than me. And and nothing stops him from doing that. And, And that's because he's got this great primary uh, allegiance. That was super. So profound, yet so simple. 
and it was just absolutely excellent. Thank you so much, Pastor Byron. Let's talk now. For those of you that are in here and may not yet have made Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, let me ask you a question. Throughout the scripture, it tells us that we are to check ourselves out from time to time. I want to just take this opportunity for you to check yourself right now. I want to ask you a question. Everybody in this room to answer that question. Nobody will know the answer but you and God, but don't just stare at me. Answer the question. If you were to walk out of this building and your heart stopped like Byron's did, and you died, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer the question in your heart. Where would you go? Some of you answer the question, you say, I hope, I hope, you know, Pastor Jim, I would go to heaven if I died. But the problem with that is nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope your way into heaven. Like I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Whoever's the greatest hoper, you know, gets to go to heaven. You're not gonna make it and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you may have answered the question and said, well, Pastor Jim, I love God a whole lot. I'm gonna go to heaven because I love God. But can I tell you something? Nowhere again, nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might have answered and said, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, I'm really a good person. I think I'm going to make it because I'm really good. Can I tell you something? Positive thinking about how good you are is not going to get you to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven and have eternal life because you think you're good enough to make it. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Tonight, I love you to tell you the truth. I want you to check yourself out. Because exactly what Pastor Byron is talking about, just as fast as that happened to him in two situations in two years, all of a sudden, he was confronted with where he's at. It could happen to you tonight. And I want to make sure you're right with God before you leave. Some of you may have answered the question, well, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. Why, they took me to catechism class or Sunday school class or our Sabbath school class when I was a child, you know. They put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck, had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. Well, great, I'm glad. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say your mom and dad can tell you a Christian and do those things with you and give you that cross to put around your neck or have your Christian or baptized get you into heaven? It's not, you're not gonna make it. Now stop and think about it just for a moment. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Now listen to the words again. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. That means you can't get to heaven your way, and you can't get to heaven my way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven. In the scripture, John 3rd chapter, he says, you must be born again. Bottom line for every single one of us that are in here, you must be born again. Now, a lot of people that attend American churches don't know what born again means, but let me tell you what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be, all or nothing. And I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a statement. What a rude and crude statement that Jesus makes. And what he really means by that is simply this. Listen to this. I'll tell you what it means. It means that people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. There's no such thing as lukewarm Christianity. It's an all or nothing relationship. Because if you're lukewarm according to the words of Jesus, when he comes, he will vomit you out of his mouth. Please don't clap. You're, you're just scaring everything away. Please don't do that. I'm not here to get a clap offering. I'm here to win souls. So every one of us that are in here, listen to me. You cannot get to heaven 
your way or my way. We've got to get to heaven Jesus' way. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Now, here we are in this safe and friendly place, man. You have heard a testimony. You have sung the songs. We have had a great time tonight. We've clapped our hands. Why not, for those of you that are not right with God, get right with God tonight in this safe and friendly place? You couldn't find a better place to get right with God. And Jesus is calling you home. Tonight is your night of salvation. And you're gonna have to realize that means you're gonna have to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. You can no longer be lukewarm. Lukewarm is this, a little in, a little out, little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but you know, he's not everything. Uh -huh, he's just something, and Byron talked about that. You can't just make him something and expect to make it to heaven. You've got to put him first and number one and everything. And only you can make that kind of a commitment of all of your heart and all of your life by giving God all of your heart and life. I can't make you do it. Jesus is not floating around in some cosmic cloud with a two by four to hit you in the head. Nobody can make you do this. But Jesus is calling you home. You have to make the commitment to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. So here we are in this safe, friendly place. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Well, you gotta do it his way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, but if you deny me, I'll deny you. If you sit there and go, no, I'm not gonna do this, for whatever reason, guess what, and you know you're not right with God, then the time comes that you're standing before God, and that could be tonight. He'll say, I don't know you either. You denied me. Don't let that happen. Give God all of your heart. Give God all of your life in this safe and friendly place today. God brought you here. It's a divine appointment with God. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Well, I'm gonna count to three in a moment. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And when I do that, I'm gonna pound on this platform, this little pulpit area. I'll bend down with my, with my microphone. I'll go one, two, three. And I go bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. And I'll see your hand go up. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans because I already know you know who Jesus is, but having him in your head won't get you to heaven. The devil knows who Jesus is, and he's not going to heaven. So it's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. So when I count to three, I'll pop my hands on this pulpit area. You get your hand up all over this house and then put it right back down. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, hold on. You mean you want me to raise my hand? Well, if I raise my hand, people will see me. I'll feel weird, I'll feel funny. People behind me will see me. The people I came with will know uh, that I, I'm doing this. I'll feel funny. Yep, you might. But it's better to feel funny in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever, ever and ever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees. Come on, today it's not about what men think. It's about what God sees. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, be honest with yourself, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Give him all of your heart. Give him all of your life. Tonight is your night of salvation. Are you ready? I'm gonna count to three. Here it is, here it is, your call. One, two, Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you, back over here. Anybody else? There's six back over here. Thank you, God bless you. Anybody else? There's seven back over on this side. They're pointing up there. There's seven or another one over there, eight. Thank you, God bless you. Anybody else? There's another one down in here somewhere. Oh, I see you, okay, God bless you. Eight, nine, thank you. Anybody else? In the, in the foyer, here comes some people from the foyer. Anybody else, real quick? Real quick, anybody else? Anybody else? There's seven or eight, nine people. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another person over here. God bless you. Whoever, oh, back over there. Thank you, Paul. In the family room. Gotcha. Gotcha. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for about nine or ten people. So good, so good, so good. So happy that you're doing that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, all nine or 10 of you that raised your hand, even in the family room, the ushers will help you. But I want you to get a hold of your code, purse, water, Bible, friend, get your stuff. And get out of your seat, 
here's what I want you to do. Uh, you're not gonna get saved by raising your hand. We're gonna pray with you. It only takes a few moments. Nothing weird goes on, I promise you. But I want you to get a hold of your coat and purse, sweater, Bible friend, the stuff you brought. Bring a friend. If you're sitting next to somebody and they said, listen, uh, I raised my hand, but I don't feel, I feel funny about going. Say, come on, I'll go with you. And if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, this is your time. I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet us right here in front. Come on, you come right now. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Won't you come just as you are? Oh, and hear the Spirit call. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come just as Come on, if you raise your you hand, you're serious. Are. Get out of your seat and come, come on. Come and see. Come on, come on out of the family room. Come receive. Come and live forevermore. Oh, they're still coming. Give them a hand as they come. They're still coming. Give them a hand as they come out of the foyer. Thank God you guys have come. We're real excited about you coming. I just want you to look to your left. This is Dr. B, like the bumblebee. We, his real last name is Becker, but we don't want to say Becker. We like Dr. B. So he's a good guy. No weird stuff's going on. He's going to do three things. Pray with you, give you some free stuff. Everybody loves free about what to do next and then share with you a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. If you can make a left turn and follow Dr. Becker right over this way. Isn't that good? 